In this lecture, we will look at the concept of relative velocity. Uh, it turns out that all velocities are relative, um, although we sometimes suppress that notation um, and that meaning. Um, we will uh, make it very clear this time, and we'll show some problems. Basically, this is a really nice example um, that uses vector equations and the manipulation of vectors. So that's why we're doing it right now at the very beginning. Um, so we'll go through a, a derivation of, of what relative velocity is and how the terminology works, um, and also um, how you derive the expression that we're going to use, the main equation for relative velocity, and talk briefly about the, the physical significance of this. Um, then we'll do three examples. So we'll start out simply um, with motion along a line, a one-dimensional problem. Then we'll do two two-dimensional problems. And as we've mentioned before, when you have a vector equation, there are basically two ways that you can try and solve that vector equation. One is algebraically, meaning choose a coordinate system, find the components of your vectors, and solve equations in those variables. Um, and the other is graphical, meaning uh, do a graphical sum of vectors and try to figure that out with some trigonometry or geometry. So we'll do uh, one example in each technique. So uh, just to start with, uh, let's talk about what we mean by relative velocity. So the basic equation that we're going to use is this one, VAC is equal to VAB plus VBC. Um, the important thing to note is this B that appears here. So um, let's, let's say what it is in words. Well, let's define what VAC is. This is the velocity vector of object A, object A, with respect to object B. So uh, we're talking about the velocity of some object, A, but with respect to another object. So basically, considering the second object to be motionless, what's the velocity of object A? Um, so what does this equation say in words? It says the velocity of object A with respect to object C is equal to the velocity of A with respect to object B plus the velocity of B with respect to object C. So we'll do an, a, an example in a moment, which is, um, say, the velocity of a person with respect to the ground is equal to the velocity of the person with respect to a train plus the velocity of the train with respect to the ground. And of course, this plus sign is the addition of vectors. So we're going to be doing a bunch of vector uh, addition. So this is a vector equation, and we'll assume that it is true. Um, I'll show you in a, in a few minutes why it's true, where, what it comes from. It comes from a very simple idea involving the position vectors. Um, but basically, we'll just start problems by using it. You'll find this equation on your equation sheet, for example. So uh, let's look at it through an example. So uh, imagine that you're riding on a train, and the train is moving through a city. So maybe it's not traveling too fast. It's only going 30 miles per hour. Um, and at some moment, you decide to run across the dining car. So maybe it's only like, I don't know, 10 or 20 feet across. But you run across at 5 miles per hour um, from one side of the train to the other. So perpendicular to the direction in which the train is moving. Now, one could ask, um, what is the velocity vector of u with respect to, not the train, but something else, like the, the ground on the outside? And you can see uh, that the velocity of u with respect to the ground would not be 5 miles per hour, um, because the train is in fact moving with respect to the ground. So we want to try and make these ideas precise. So the first step is to try and figure out what we have. Um, and as you see from up here, in general, when we use this equation, there will be three objects that we consider. You could actually have more objects, so the A with respect to B plus B with respect to C plus C with respect to D, that would be velocity of A relative to D, but we'll usually just use three. So what are the three objects here? And you have to sort of pull that out of the, the question. Well, obviously there's one which is U, um, and we'll, we'll give you the initial Y. Um, then there's the train, and that's the initial t. What's the third one? 
Well, it's an implicit one, and it comes about from the way that this is described. The train is traveling 30 miles per hour. Um, it turns out that velocities have to be given with respect to something else, and here is a sentence where it wasn't given, just the train is traveling 30 miles per hour, as if that's some absolute thing. Well, it's implied when we say the train travels 30 miles per hour that it's with respect to the ground next to the train. So we might say um, the earth or the ground, let's say ground, the ground G. Uh, so that's our third object, the motionless earth. Now, of course, earth is not motionless. Earth is traveling around the sun. The sun travels around the galaxy. So um, you can see that it, uh, even the, it's, it, we don't mean to say that the ground is fixed. We just mean to say that we can measure the velocities of other things relative to it. So what are the velocities that we have then? Well, the given ones were um, the train is moving 30 miles per hour. So that means that the magnitude of the velocity of the train with respect to the ground is equal to 30 miles per hour. The other given quantity was um, u. So u are running 5 miles per hour. But that's not relative to the ground. That's just u running across the train. So that's the magnitude of the velocity of u relative to the train. And that's 5 miles per hour. Now we can draw those as vectors. So I've just listed their magnitudes, but this is the vector of u moving relative to the train. And then the vector of the train moving relative to the ground would be something like this. Obviously, it should be bigger. Um, that's the train relative to the ground. And then we could write down some equation that relates those two uh, velocities. Um, and we use our basic equation, the one that you can pull off of your equation sheet, in order to write down a true equation. Uh, not every equation that you can write down with those things is true, but if you get it from this equation, VAC is equal to VAB plus VBC, then it will become a true equation. So what do I mean get it? Well, let's look for example at the velocity of u with respect to the ground. That's an unknown velocity so far because we weren't given that. Well, how, how do we find it? Look at this. There's a little mapping that happens. I've replaced the object A with object U and object C with object ground. So that means I'm going to say A, B, and C become, well, we have A goes to U and C goes to ground. Well, B is unknown so far, but we already know that there are three objects, so it must be the third. So B is going to be train. So what do we do? Well, we say um, VAB is going to be VU train, and VBC is going to be V train ground. So I've just mapped ABC to U train ground, and I've been careful to do it in each term there. So we arrive now at an equation, which is true. This is a true equation for the quantities that we're looking at, which are u, train, and ground. And um, we're not going to solve a problem with that right now, so that's just an example. Um, but when we do solve problems, we'll do it exactly that way. So we have this equation, but why is it true? So why is it true that VAC is equal to VAB plus VBC? Well, it, it concerns the position vectors of each object. So let's imagine that that train is going through, and here you are on the train. You're doing your little run across the train, and maybe this is me waving to you from the ground. Well, we could put a coordinate system on the ground, and we could measure the position of the train relative to that coordinate system on the ground. So um, let's put a coordinate system on the train as well, here. And that coordinate system is in motion. So that's the coordinate system attached to the train. And I could give it a position, which will certainly be changing in time. And that position is the position of the train relative to the ground. Okay. Now, from the train's coordinate system, we could find positions of objects on the train. So, in particular, we could find the position of you 
So there's a position vector of u, but since this is on the train's coordinate system, we would say that this is the position of u relative to the train. Maybe I should move that a little bit. I don't see why. Maybe you already see why. And I gotta move u as well. There we go. Now, the sum of these two vectors is going to be a vector that goes from the position of me on the ground to u on the train. And what do we call that? Well, that's the position of u relative to the ground. And we just said it, the sum of the vectors is that thing. So we can write this as a vector equation, which is certainly true based on the picture that I've given, which is that the position of u relative to the ground is equal to the position of the train relative to the ground plus the position of u relative to the train. Um, you could also write that as, because addition is commutative, u relative to the train plus the position of the train relative to the ground. And you can see that we've almost arrived at the equation that we are looking for. Well, if the positions are related in this way, meaning at every time, so you could say these are positions at a certain moment in time, then it's certainly true that the change in positions are also related in that way. So if I just change by going forward a slight amount in time, then the change in the positions and even the change in the positions divided by the time interval will also follow a similar equation. And what is that? Well, delta r over delta t is what we call the average velocity. So this is true for the velocities. So the velocity of u relative to the ground is equal to the velocity of u relative to the train plus the velocity of the train relative to the ground. Um, this step here, where I go from position to delta r over delta t, is called a derivative in calculus. And you don't have to know what that means for an algebra-based physics course, um, but calculus is the thing that makes this completely precise. Um, but we're not going to cover that part of it. Um, but it is, it is completely precise, the, the transition from position to velocity. Um, there's one more thing that I'd like to say about this, which is um, we figured out how to relate positions um, just by a vector diagram in space. We say that if we take this derivative or if we look at the change in the position, then we can get to a relationship between the velocities. Um, you could say, well, we could do the same thing for accelerations. Um, and it's certainly true that you could measure accelerations uh, relative to different objects. But there's something special about velocities uh, different than accelerations, which is that in physics, we assume that there's nothing, uh, that there's no preferred uh, frame in which you are moving. Meaning that if I stood, uh, sit on a train and do a physics experiment, I should get exactly the same results on that train than if I stand on the ground and do that physics experiment. So maybe you take a ball and you throw that ball up and down. Here's a little ball. We're throwing the ball up and down, and you're also throwing the ball up and down. And in both cases, you'll see the ball take a parabolic path um, exactly like you're familiar with and that we'll study in a few days. Um, another way of stating this concept is that there's no experiment that you can do to determine your velocity which is sort of why it's important that we always talk about velocities as relative to something else, because there is no absolute velocity, velocity relative to some absolute still object. And this is actually an extremely important point in physics. It's, it's the concept of what's called an inertial frame, which will come to in Newton's laws. It's so important that one of Newton's laws is in fact uh, defining this quantity of an inertial frame. And the rest of Newton's laws, the laws that tell you how to observe motion, um, can only be used when you're moving with a constant velocity. So only in an inertial frame are you allowed to do physics of the type that we're going to learn, um, which means that you, you shouldn't really go further. You shouldn't talk about the relative acceleration. 
because um, acceleration is in some sense more absolute. It's uh, the acceleration of an object is something that can be determined uh, from your position on the train. And we'll come back to this in a moment, uh, not in a moment, but in a, in a number of weeks when we do Newton's laws. Okay, so um, let's do some examples. So this is just a one-dimensional example. So we're talking about two cars on a road um, and they're on a, a highway where they're able to travel quickly, although for some reason you're not traveling very quickly. So you are in a car and the velocity of you, it says, is 60 miles per hour. So um, we know now that we can't just say that the, your velocity is 60 miles per hour. We must say that uh, your velocity is relative to something. So let's draw it and give it its correct name. It's the velocity of u relative to the ground. So whenever we talk about a 60 mile per hour car, we mean relative to the stationary earth that you're driving past. Um, then we say that your friend, Beth, so this is u, and this is Beth here. So Beth pulls up, and she's also driving with the same velocity, and we also implicitly mean that she's driving 60 miles per hour relative to the ground. So there you are. So that's what it is at one moment. Um, then at the next moment, so after you chat for a little while, or maybe you transfer a person back and forth like they do in the movie Footloose. Have you ever seen that movie? It was an old movie when I was a kid. Gotta go watch Footloose. Captain Bacon, uh-oh. Start talking about Footloose and I lose my mouse. So at the next moment, uh, Beth pulls ahead, and, and more importantly than the fact that she moves ahead is that she changes her velocity, so it's now larger than you. Um, so Beth's velocity relative to the ground is now larger. Now she's driving 70 miles an hour. Um, okay. So the questions are, what is Beth's velocity re with respect to u at each moment? So we'd like to get v Beth u as an equation. Um, we don't have that yet, but we know how to get it. So the way that we get it is we use our relative velocity equation. So we know that vac is equal to vab plus vbc. It's important you write down the correct equation first so that when you translate it, you'll get this, the right thing. So in this process, it looks like I've said that A becomes Beth, B we don't know, and C becomes U. Well, the third object is the ground. So we need to translate the rest of them. So we get V of Beth with respect to ground plus V of ground with respect to U. Okay, so that equation is true. We know that that equation is true. Now, unfortunately, that equation is not completely helpful because we've gotten a new velocity in there that doesn't correspond to the ones that we were given. We got the velocity of the ground relative to u. We have something similar. We have u relative to the ground, but it's not the same. So imagine what happens if you, sitting in your car, look out at the ground. What do you see? It doesn't look motionless. It looks like the ground is going backwards. So let's use an additional concept, which is the velocity of A relative to B is equal to minus the velocity of B relative to A. So if I do that, then we get that the velocity of Beth relative to U is equal to the velocity of Beth relative to the ground plus minus velocity of U relative to the ground. Now we have an equation that contains the thing we want and the two things that we're given. Um, so I've left it as a vector equation, but you see that everything here is, is along a line. Everything is basically along, say, the x-axis. So I really only need to look at the x components of this vector equation. So now I can write this equation as the velocity of Beth relative to u in the x direction is equal to the velocity of Beth relative to the ground in the x direction, minus the velocity of u relative to the ground in the x direction. 
And now we can solve for every moment. So if we take uh, the first moment, so at first when she's driving at the same speed as you, then we have Beth with respect to you in the x direction is Beth with respect to the ground in the x direction. Well, let's just be completely pedantic about it and take Beth's vector and find its component on our coordinate system. So we place it on the coordinate system and we see, well, this number is v beth ground x, right? We find the x component of that vector. Well, it's a positive number based on my chosen coordinate system, and it's equal to the length of the vector. So I can write that this is just the magnitude of v, oops, that v beth ground x is just the magnitude of v beth ground. I could write it that, like that, or I could write it like that. And that just means the speed. Then we have minus v u ground x. Well, v u ground is exactly the same vector. If I were to transfer this vector over to the coordinate system, I would get exactly the same result. The magnitude of the vector is equal to its x component. So this is equal to v u ground magnitude. And now that I've written all that out, I can find the number. Well, we were given the magnitude of Beth with respect to the ground is 60 miles per hour, and the magnitude of U with respect to the ground is 60 miles per hour. So the, the velocity of Beth with respect to you when she pulls up next to you is zero miles per hour. Um, OK. Now, let's find um, what it is when she pulls away. Well, it's the same equation. We already figured out the equation for Beth relative to you. We just need to plug in the new numbers. So Beth relative to you in the x direction is equal to, again, we'll get the same thing. If you take her vector and place it on this coordinate system, you'll find it's a positive x component and it's equal to the magnitude of that vector. So it's just her speed. Again, we have minus the same thing for u, but in this case, we have 70 miles per hour and 60 miles per hour. So now she's going plus 10 miles per hour in the x direction relative to u. Now, I think that probably you're looking at that and you're saying, well, that was all really obvious. Why did you do all of that work to tell me that 60 minus 60 is 0 and 70 minus 60 is 10? Well, the reason is because now we're going to start to do things in more dimensions, and it'll be a little bit more complicated. But this method allows you to see how everything works. So let's move to two dimensions. So we have a child who comes to the bank of a river and wants to swim across. Uh, let's draw it out. So we have... Um, bank of a river here and a bank of a river here and we're told that the river is um, 50 meters wide call it D um, the child is standing over here ready to swim and she wants to go across the river um, and she already knows that when she's swimming, that she can swim at one meter per second. She's timed herself doing 25 meters in a pool, for example, and she, it takes her 25 seconds. Um, so she knows how fast she can swim relative to water, um, but the river itself is flowing at four meters per second. So let's translate those things into relative velocities, as we know we should. The river velocity is measured, of course, relative to the shore. So this is the velocity of the river relative to the shore. And when she starts to swim, um, she's going to have a velocity vector. Uh, let's call it the velocity of the child with respect to the river. And why do we say that it's the child with respect to the river and not child with respect to the shore? Well, because 
what we were given was the speed she can swim with respect to still water. So she measured it in a pool where the water wasn't moving at all, and she found she was able to go one meter per second. Well, she can do the same thing in this water. It's just that the water itself will be moving at the same time, and then her velocity relative to the shore might be something different. So let's find our true equation. So we have uh, VAC is equal to VAB plus VBC. And let's make our translation. So let's say, um, ignoring what the questions are that were asked, let's just try and figure out an equation that relates these velocities. Let's try and figure out what uh, the child's velocity relative to the shore is. So that means that A becomes C and C becomes S. And it must be that b becomes the third thing, which is the river. So we get it's the velocity of the child relative to the river plus the velocity of the river relative to the shore. And this is a true equation, but it's also a nice equation, unlike the previous one we did, because we have already these vectors. So um, we might want to find child relative to the shore. We know at least the magnitude of child relative to the river. and uh, we were given the velocity of the river relative to the shore. So let's try and answer the questions now. So first question is, what's the quickest that she can cross the river? And the thing that we can change is the direction in which she goes. Um, and so we might try and figure out what's the direction in which she should point herself such that she gets across the river in the least amount of time. Well, what does it mean to get across the river? It means that you want to go this distance, and let's give that a direction. Let's call that the y-axis. So you want to go in the y direction across the river. And in fact, getting across, it doesn't matter where you are on the x, it only matters that you go from 0 in y to d in y. So we're really only interested in delta y becoming equal to d. And when we say delta y, um, we can find that in the velocity with respect to the ground. So the velocity of the child relative to the shore, we can think of as um, an average velocity uh, relative to the shore. And so that is uh, delta r, the change in position over change in time. And that means that it's going to have um, a delta y, with sorry, a delta x with respect to time, and a delta y with respect to time. And so the child with respect to the shore in the x direction comma, the child with respect to the shore in the y direction are equal to these two things. So the thing that we're interested in is how long it takes for her to get across uh, with delta y equal to d. So in order to get the shortest time, we want to get this thing the largest, which means we want to get the y component of the child with respect to the shore to be the largest. So let's examine what the y, what the child with respect to the shore vector looks like. So again, we were given this true, or we found this true equation, and graphically what it means is um, it is child with respect to the river, so something like this, plus river with respect to the shore, so something like this, and that gives us a resultant of the child with respect to the shore. So getting across the river in the quickest time means that we want to maximize the y component of that resultant vector. Well, you can see how to do it here. The fact that I pointed this child with respect to river backwards meant that um, the, this level is not quite as high as it could have been. If we had pointed this thing straight up, then this thing would have a larger y component. So in order to do it fastest, so to get across fastest, we want to make sure that she points 
with V child river straight up the y-axis, then there's still going to be the additional velocity of river to the shore, which does not at all change the y component of V child shore. But you notice that the y component of V child shore is now larger than it was. So the fastest way is to have her point directly across. And now we can actually calculate it. So um, if she's pointing directly across, then we can change this vector. So let's put V child river directly across now. Um, and we can calculate how long it takes to get across. So um, let's use our true equation again. So V child shore is equal to V child river plus V river shore. Um, and V child river is going to be zero comma the magnitude of how fast she can go. And if you look at this, this vector here, it has a zero x component and a y component that's equal to its length. So that number, when we plug it in, will just be one meter per second. Then we have V river shore, uh, which is uh, four meters per second. Well, let's give it its name. So it's V river shore magnitude comma zero. So this will be four when we plug it in. And this equation on the left-hand side, this is the x component and the y component. So you notice that this becomes V river shore comma V child river. And as we talked about over here, we're only interested in that y component to find the amount of time it takes to go across by d. So this equation, the important part of this equation, becomes v child shore in the y is equal to, um, which is equal to delta y over delta t, is equal to just v child river. And now we can solve. So we get d over delta t is v child river, which means that delta t is equal to the distance over v child river, which is going to be, I think it was 50 meters, divided by one meter per second. So it's going to be 50 seconds that it takes to go across. So we've used the y component of this equation in order to figure out the amount of time that it takes to go in the y direction a certain distance. Uh, what was the other question? Where does she end up? So now we're, we're wondering the other thing. So what's happening uh, in the other uh, direction? What's happening in the x direction? Um, what we want to find then is we want to find this delta x. So this equation that we found will help us so remember, this is two equations. This, this equation here is two equations. So we can use uh, V child shore x, which is equal to delta x over delta t. But V child shore, we see, is V river shore. So that's just V river shore is equal to delta x over delta t. And in this case, we're wondering how far. So what is delta x? So delta x is equal to v river shore times delta t. And we now know what delta t is because we know how long it takes before she hits the other shore. So that's going to be 4 meters per second times 50 seconds. So she's going to end up 200 meters. Well, I don't know which direction that is. Down river. So she'll get there quickest by pointing herself across, but she won't land across because the direction of her velocity vector with respect to the shore will be pointed something like this. So she'll end up going like this. Even though she's looking at the other bank the entire time, she'll be floating downstream as she goes there. Okay, last example, another two-dimensional one. This time we'll deal with a plane. So um, we're told that an airplane can fly with an airspeed of 500 kilometers per hour, 
And then there's a jet stream over Lake Michigan, which is directed to the northeast at 100 kilometers per hour. So the question is, what direction should the plane point to fly due west? And an interesting point is that Grand Rapids and Milwaukee airports are basically exactly along the same line of latitude. Milwaukee is directly west from Grand Rapids. So we'll say that the plane's going to Milwaukee from Grand Rapids. How long will the trip take? Um, so we have two questions. What direction does it point, and how long will the trip take? Well, as usual, uh, we want to try and figure out um, what's going on and give these velocity vectors the proper names by figuring out what the objects are. Um, so let's try and draw a picture. Uh, first of all, let's look at Milwaukee and Grand Rapids. They're sitting here. And we're told that the distance between, were we told? Oh yes, it's 200 kilometers is the distance. Oops. We have 200 kilometers for the distance from Grand Rapids to Milwaukee. And we want to draw the vectors that we have. So um, one vector that we were given was the jet stream. And we were given everything that we need to know about that vector. We're told that it points northeast and that it has a magnitude of 100 kilometers per hour. So um, what do we mean by jet stream, though? Well, jet stream is the air moving across the Earth. And in fact, its velocity is measured with respect to the Earth. So when we say jet stream, we mean that we have a vector that points to the northeast. And we're going to call that the velocity of the air with respect to the ground. That's what the jet stream is. Um, now, we were also given information about the plane, an airspeed of 500 kilometers per hour. But notice we were not told the direction of that vector. So um, we could just draw some like uh, tentative velocity. So obviously, we want to go somewhere towards Milwaukee. So it's going to look something like this. But we don't actually know the angle. That it takes so we don't know that but we do know that um, well in the first case we were told that the magnitude was 100 kilometers per hour and now we're told that the plane so this is the plane relative to well look at what it said an air speed so that's the speed of the plane relative to the air so this is plane relative to the air. Uh, I don't want to put a vector sign over it because I want to label it with its magnitude is 500 kilometers per hour. So now we've given names to the vectors. We've sort of shown whatever it is that we know, um, but we haven't yet, um, uh, we don't yet know exactly what the full vector is for plane with respect to the air, meaning we don't know which way it should point. Um, and we don't have the third vector here, although you see we do have three objects, air, ground, and plane. So the key point here is that a plane leaves the ground in Grand Rapids, but wants to get back to the ground in uh, Milwaukee. So in order to do that, it must be true that the plane with respect to the ground is a vector that points due west. So I don't know what the length of this vector is, but I do know that its direction must point due west. That's the only way that you can end up to the west of where you started, is if your velocity with respect to the ground points in that way. OK, so now we have three vectors. And let's see how they're related. So we start with our basic equation. AC is equal to AB plus BC. And we're looking for plane with respect to ground, maybe. Um, and so that is plane ground. So now I've associated A with plane, C with ground. So that means I have V plane with the third thing, which is the air, plus V air with ground. And you might ask, how do I know that I should pick this one as my equation? Um, why am I going immediately for plane ground? Why didn't I say uh, plane air is equal to something something? The answer is it doesn't matter. So 
um, you'll get an equation that is true as long as you make these associations. And then using the fact that VAB is equal to minus VBA, you can get to an equation that contains the vectors that you want. So you don't have to worry that you wrote down the right equation. You just have to worry that you wrote down an equation which matches the original one, the one that appears on your equation sheet. Okay, so we're given this, we found this equation. Now in the previous question, we tried to plug in uh, components for each of these vectors and then solve some equations, some algebraic equations, to try and figure out the things that were unknown. We could do that here. So we could assign some unknown um, angle here, and we could express the components of plane with respect to the air as like 500 kilometers times cosine theta and 500 kilometers times sine theta. And then we could solve for the unknowns, which are like the angles. Um, it turns out that algebraically that's a little bit more difficult. Um, it's still doable, but it, it's hard to invert a sine theta. So that's one reason why the graphical method is actually an easier one in this case. So let's try that out. So now that we have a true vector equation, we can use it to draw a true vector addition. So what does this equation say? Well, it says that v plane ground, this vector, which we know must point to the west, but we don't actually know its length, it must be the resultant of adding plane air to air ground. So let's look at that. So in this case, I know the resultant vector already. So I'm going to start by drawing the resultant vector. So this is v plane ground. And that thing is going to be the sum of v plane air and v air ground. Well, I don't know the direction of plane air, so I'm actually going to reverse those two things first. So v air ground plus v plane air. And that means I can draw v air ground first, which I know exactly how it looks. There it is. So there's v air ground. And then I want to add v plane air to it. I don't know which way it points, but I do know it has to end up here. So in fact, I do know which way it points. So I draw v plane air like this. Now we should check ourselves. Is this vector addition correct? Well, this says air ground plus plane air is equal to plane ground. And that's exactly what this equation says. So we started out with an equation that's true. We made it into an equation that's true for this particular problem. And then we found a graphical representation of that, which is also true. And I should remind you that not every addition of these vectors, even these three vectors, is a true addition. You have to start from the thing that's true. So now what do we do? Well, now we want to solve for the unknowns. And some of our unknowns are, one of our unknowns is the length of this vector. The other unknown is the angle at which this vector takes. But there are plenty of things we do know. We do know the length of this vector, and we know its angle. It's 45 degrees. So how do we solve it? Well, we make a triangle. So there's a triangle that looks like this. where this side is v plane ground, and this side is v plane air, magnitudes right now, and then this side is v air ground. And as I've said before, I don't like to do anything but right angle triangles, so I'm going to make a right angle out of it, a right angle triangle out of it. Um, I also know that this angle is 45, theta we'll call it, I do not know what this angle is, and I'll call that phi. I'm not sure if that's exactly the same. Well, I drew this one in the wrong way, so it's not exactly the same phi as we had before. So can we solve this thing? Well, let's take a look. Um, let's call this x and y. I could find those values, and the reason is because I have this small triangle here. So I know that um, sine of theta is equal to y for v air ground, which means that y is equal to v air ground times sine of theta. And that I can find a number for. x 
is going to be var ground cosine of theta. I can find another number for that. And now that I know um, this side here, and uh, I also know the hypotenuse, then I could figure out what tan what the phi is. So I know that uh, sine of phi is equal to y over v plane air. So I can find a, a number for phi by taking the inverse sine. So phi is equal to the inverse sine of y over v plane air. So that can give me a number now. And once I have that angle, then I could figure out what x is because uh, cosine of phi is equal to um, v plane ground plus x over v plane air. Oh no, I already know what x is, but I can figure out what v plane ground is. And that's just from inverting the cosine again. So, or not inverting the cosine, I would just solve for v plane ground. So that would be uh, v plane ground is equal to uh, v plane air cosine phi minus x. And that would give me a number. So where does that leave us? Well, I'm not going to plug in every one of those numbers there, but you can do that in your own calculator. So we've used what we knew about uh, this particular triangle to figure out what x and y are. Then we used y to figure out what phi is. That tells us the direction in which the plane is traveling. And then we used um, uh, phi and the hypotenuse to find out what this length is in order to find out what v plane ground is. So we know everything about this triangle now from that little analysis. Um, so to answer the questions, it turns out that the airplane does not go in that direction, but the way that the plane should point should be um, in this way, and it looks like it should be pointing, uh, so the way that the plane should point as it flies should be like this, and, and the angle that it should make with the west direction should be phi. So that angle phi is exactly the same, you can see, as the angle phi in this triangle. So that's the angle that it goes. We would say that that's a south of west angle. That's what you tell the pilot. You want to fly phi degrees south of west. And the last question, how long will the trip take? Well, that means we need to use the delta x here and the delta t to find uh, the amount of time. So once we found v plane ground in magnitude, well, that is exactly the v average x value. So that's just going to be distance over time. So the amount of time that it takes is going to be equal to the distance over v plane ground, which again, we were not given from the beginning. We were given the plane with respect to the air. Plane ground will be slightly smaller than that, you can see, because part of the speed of the plane is being used to keep yourself on a straight path to actually arrive at Milwaukee. And that will arrive at, a, at another number, which you'll have to find yourself. So that completes the relative velocity lecture.